Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemper. I'm the Chief Digital Officer for Dataversity. We want to thank you for joining the latest in the monthly webinar series, Data Architecture Strategies with Donna Burbank. Today, Donna will discuss master data management, aligning data, process, and governance. A couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them by the Q&A panel. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change that to network with everyone. To open the chat and the Q&A panels, you'll find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you the speaker of the monthly series, Donna Burbank. Donna is a recognized industry expert in information management with over 20 years experience helping organize, organizations enrich their business opportunities through data and information. She is currently the Managing Director of Global Data Strategy Limited, where she assists organizations around the globe in driving value from their data. And with that, let me turn it over to Donna to get her presentation started. Hello and welcome. Hello, Shannon. Always a pleasure to do these. And hello to everyone on the call. Nice to see some familiar names. And I know a lot of you join these regular, like regularly, so appreciate that. Uh, good to see you all. For those of you who don't join us um, regularly, um, this is a series. Um, each month, we pick a different topic in data architecture or data management. Um, the nice thing about one of the nice things about data diversity is that all of these are recorded um, for as long as diversity exists so that you uh, can go back to any of these you might have missed. Um, and then hopefully um, if any of these uh, other topics are of interest to you throughout the year, uh, be great if you joined us on the ones coming up. So um, without further ado, uh, today's topic is master data management. Um, we, as Shannon mentioned, I run a company called Global Data Strategy where we, we do consulting and, and do this for a living. And we are just seeing more and more interest in master data management uh, coming up this year. Um, I mean, we've, we've been doing this for years, but it does seem like this is even a much more of a hot topic than even in the past, um, probably because it ties into a lot of the other hot topics we're seeing, which is data governance and data quality and data architecture and all of that. So um, uh, it, it, the, the, it's tons of opportunity uh, and the value of, of managing your core data assets, which are your master data. Um, is super valuable, which is why everyone looks to do it. It's also can be a challenge. And, and so hopefully what we can offer, what I always try to offer in this webinar uh, series is just really practical, real world advice from folks who have done this for a living and hopefully avoid some of the pains and scars we, we might have had in the past and share some of the good things that have worked. So um, that's the, the goal. Obviously, this is just a high level. I mean, this could be a whole series in itself, just master data management. There's a lot of pieces to it, which Again, all of them at their core are pretty simple. It's just putting everything together in one piece, which makes anything that's cross-functional like that can, can tend to be complicated. Um, but we'll go through that and hopefully kind of demystify what master data is all about. If you've if you've joined any of um, my webinars in the past, you've probably seen this framework. We tend to use it a lot. Th this is the framework we use in our practice. Aligns um, in many ways with things like the DEMA, DMBOG, or Data Management Body of Knowledge. Um, um, and, and, and we use this in our own practice all the time. So master data management is a key part of any data management effort and, and any data strategy. We always try to make it, make anything we do look strategic, uh, just strict, yeah, I can talk today, strategically across the organization, particularly with master data management. It is the linchpin that makes your company run, right? So you need to align it with your business strategy. Um, to make sure that we're getting that correct single view of the customer and product and, and why we're doing it. There's a lot of other touch points um, uh, with master data in, in this framework. Data governance is a big one, right? Master data, why it's master um, or core, a lot of companies are using that term now, is um, because it's touched by a lot of groups. And, and what, what happens when you have data that's shared by a lot of different groups, you need something like governance, right? So that naturally fits in. You know, a lot of these other things like data quality, that's a core part of master data management, data architecture and the modeling and the hierarchies. And you know, so almost all of these uh, touch in, in some way or form master data, which, which makes master data super powerful, uh, but also takes a little bit of planning and coordination across these areas. Because when you do get it right, that's what really drives your business strategy. And really, you know, those are the companies that are working really efficiently and really well across the organization. Um, so what is master data management? I'm a uh, data management person, so I love my definitions. <laughs> I put that in the glossary, right? So, uh, and I like to use Gartner. They tend to have some really good um, 
definitions. I know there's is, is others out there, but you know, master data is the consistent set of identifiers and attributes that defy the core entities of the enterprises, including you know, customers, prospects, citizens, suppliers, sites, hierarchies, chart of accounts, things like that. Uh, and then obviously master data management is the management of master data, right? So um but but really, I, I like their definition in that it does talk about it's a technology enabled discipline, um, but it allows business and IT work together for all of the you know data stewardship, semantic consistency, accountability, right? And it really touches all of it. There are master data management tools out there. Highly recommend you use one. You can build them yourselves too. But you know, there's a reason that folks have built tools around these. But it's not a technology solution only. Right, and that's what makes this sort of complicated. You have to get the right people in place. I like the fact that they mentioned cons cons semantic consistency. We'll get, we'll get into that on this. You know, what is a customer? What is a product? What is a citizen? Right, all of these things that drive your business that seem like it would be so simple. You know, the, the more that it drives your company, there's probably a lot of nuance to answer so that. Even that semantic consistency or the the basic data definitions and data model and hierarchies around what is the thing. Is really important because everyone the, again the more people that touch it they all have their own viewpoint around that so anyway that's what we're talking about um another way to look at that and this is an actual picture from an early cave dwelling in paris i think it was you know, when they were excavating, excavating some of the tunnels obviously i'm kidding but they um when you look back we are visual creatures right and, and we often you know when you think of you know the, the cave people way back they drew on the walls things that were important to them, pictures of themselves, the animals, you know, that was probably their early master data. What did they do for a living? They hunted, right? And you could just tell that. I know I'm a big geek. That's probably what I see when I see hieroglyphs was, oh, early master data, but it really is. All right. And I think uh, I'm also, if you've been on any of my other webinars, a big fan of data modeling, you know, and, and data modeling visualization, because I think it just makes it really clear. You can see right there, a caveman, you know, sometimes they've been kind of washed off. You don't see the full, you know, cardinality rules on the cave dwelling, uh, but they sure they had them, right, that a caveman could hunt more than one animal, right? Um, so anyway, uh, but I do think that the beauty of that um, is that it is visual and you can get see the relationships because that is the core um, of master data is that it does have a lot of relationships with other areas. Um, sorry for my bad jokes today. Um, so um, m moving on, what is master data? And, and this is another odd Donna slide, but one of the reasons I love my job on a good day <laughs> is that as a consultant, you go into so many different kinds of companies, right? And you really understand how their business ticks and then the data behind that. And I almost forget that, you know, I'm actually seeing a lot of stuff about a company because data runs the company, right? I'm I'm not really thinking about that. I'm thinking about the data itself, right? But it really does drive. And when you think of examples of master data, I find it fun to kind of think of all the different companies we work for, especially now that everybody's doing data. The, the idea of being a data-driven organization is hot, right? So it's not only anyone who's been in the industry, um, you know, for many, many years, We've all worked in finance and we've all worked in some of the big, you know, government and things like that. Um, and the idea of, you know, customers and product is, is sort of your classic master data. But now that so many different kind of companies are, are coming into the let's be data driven, I find it kind of fun to see the different different types of things that are considered master data. And then also the business impact of that. So um I, you might wonder about some of these. So the, the other thing is when we go, we often do kind of data strategies or data assessments, and we try to understand either opportunities or pain points um, around the data. And, and I, I find it interesting that when you go through the interviews, there's generally that one story, or and I know we want to be data driven, but there's, you know, the, you know, examples that, that kind of drive things, the anecdotes, right? Um, and in this one company, it was cheese, right? And it's, it's sort of funny. I felt like it was in this bizarre horror movie where talking to people, whenever you brought up cheese, they had this sort of look of, oh, not the cheese slice. Don't bring that. I'm like, what am I missing? How can this cheese slice be so scary? Um, but they actually lost over a million US dollars. Um, it was a restaurant, and and basically, when you think of their master data, it's it's not even the the menu items, right? It's the components or the you know when you think of products and product components and and materials um, that if they're making a hamburger or something, all of those pieces of it, right? The 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 meat, the cheese, the the bread, all of that goes into it needs to be costed and, and managed across the whole product life cycle from when it's developed in the kitchen to when the supply chain costs it to when marketing sets the price to when it's on the point of sale system and you order it into in the restaurant right and that is master data and that's a master data process um 
that aligns with the business process and that was broken. So what, what it was cost should have been costed at from supply chain didn't match what the price was for marketing that ended up on the menu when people bought it. So it was a, you could add things to this menu and people added this new kind of funky new cheese um, and it wasn't priced accordingly. So this great new menu item that they had that was very popular actually became the bane of their existence because they were losing money every time someone ordered it. You know, worst case scenario, right? You're, you, you've basically priced your product wrong. Well, how that how that came about was everybody is now freaked out about cheese. Every time you mention the word cheese, people look at you in fear. But that again, that's a who would have thought, you know, I think of Swiss cheese as master data. It really is, right? That was their core components. Now we had another one, uh, $2 million lost over baby bottles. We work with a company that manufactured and sold baby bottles and a lot of it um, they sold through uh, Amazon. Um, and if you've worked with Amazon, they have very good master data and they make you, you match it. So if I want to sell product on Amazon, I have to match their master data standards. Um, and, and if you don't, you get a fine. And this company had such bad master data for their own products, they could not easily match you know, Amazon's um, format and they kept getting fines. And they had over 2 million. It was worth selling it because they sold much more than 2 million. It was a very large company. Um, but just, just because this literally was one-to-one -one a master data issue, they were literally getting a fine because of the format of their data. Um, one of my favorite ones is, <laughs> you might wonder about the dead fish up in the upper, upper right. We actually did a webinar on data diversity with this company, is, or not a company, organization is the Environment Agency of England. Um, and we, this was a bunch of scientists and, and what, what the Environment Agency does, very cool organization, you know, they, they track, um, you know, fish populations and they also track how many cows there are and how many organisms there are in the water. And, and we had a bunch of scientists get together and what is their master data? What are they counting? What are they tracking? It, it was living organisms. Um, and then someone brought up, uh, well, what about a dead fish? Is that still a living organism? And I just came back, well, that's a living organism with a status of dead. <laughs> Maybe you had to be in the conversation, but it was very funny. But what they came out to be um, was that an organism, whether it's an, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to show that I'm not a scientist, the uh, thing in the water, the, the small organism in the water uh, versus a cow versus a fish could all be classified as an organism. And the master data could have been the same. And that was a huge aha moment for their scientific discovery. And, and they're publishing out metrics to the public. They had a big open data set. Um, so again, you probably don't think of dead fish or cows when you think of master data. Um, but it was that's that is their business over there or, you know, was it was to really track organisms across the across the country. Um, on the lower left, you know, we, we've worked with hospitals and, and trying to get credentials for their um, their doctors. Right. So if, if someone's doing surgery, can they get into the wing of that hospital? Are they credentialed to do heart surgery. Uh, you, you certainly hope your hospital is doing that. So that the doctors that's, you know, operating on you has the right credentials. But that was a big part of it. So doctors our master data. Um, customer is sort of that middle one that is classic. We worked with a big um, insurance company and they had done a lot of really cool advanced analytics. Um, this was an insurance company that only, only insured people like you and me, you know, high net worth individuals that have multiple mansions across the globe and own several companies and have their Renoir paintings insured with them and things like that, right? So it was very beneficial for them to understand their their high net worth customers and they did a lot of you know research and did a lot of web scraping and things like that to understand a lot of information about you know how many companies these people own and things like that problem was they did all that cool analytics but when they tried to look at their own policies they couldn't tell you know is john smith um the the multi-billionaire who owns 17 companies or john smith the courier who delivered our pizza today um and has an auto policy with us but isn't you know, the John Smith that's a billionaire, right? So they did all this cool analytics. It was a very important business, you know, decision for them, but they didn't have good master data. So they kind of had to stop all of that. Um, another one on the right, uh, which was master data, I'll bring it back to the Environment Agency again. Again, they did a great webinar on their data modeling efforts a couple of years ago now on data versities library. Um, and, and another piece of their data, their master data, was regions, or they call them catch, catchments, right? Of if I'm if I'm div dividing up the country of England, um, what are the different areas that these organisms live in? And and they they publish maps and things like that. So actually, location um, might might be something for a, a retail company. What are our different locations around the globe? Um, or you could argue that maybe that's reference data. Isn't location a, a reference data item, right? And, and this is all subjective. What um, what is one person's reference data might be someone else's master data, right? It really depends what your organization is doing for a living. Location is one that often is 
Uh, Master Data, the other thing, and I, I won't go through all of my Donna rants, but I'm also amazed that the importance of this information, multi-billion dollar companies or organizations or governments we've worked with, it's classic to have this in somebody's spreadsheet, right? And, and often they're named, oh, it's the Mary spreadsheet or the Joe, the Joe spreadsheet that has all of our locations of all our retail you know, sites across the globe. And I'm I'm still flabbergasted by that. I'm not anymore because I see it a lot, but that that's kind of scary. That is, those those are your golden nuggets of your organization. Probably the worst one I've seen, um, or best, if you want to tell the story, it was with a big water company, and they did a lot of acquisitions. So merger and acquisition is always a great use case for master data because you're trying, you know, the core assets of one company need to be aligned with another. Um, and so they this water company had acquired a smaller water company and wanted to get all of the, the, the customers or the subscribers. Um, and it was a small local water company and they literally had it in a paper notebook where it was written down on paper and with ink. <laughs> and that was, it was a little hard to scan in. They were trying to automate that process, but you couldn't do it literally was on paper. You don't see that a whole lot. Usually it's a spreadsheet, but you know, even, even in this day and age, that was only a few years ago. Um, it was literally written down on a notebook. So who knows? But that, hopefully that gives you some different examples of master data just to stretch the story a bit longer. I, I just started to go through, you know, I, again, this is why my job can be fun. Uh, just to, to keep going on the cows, right? So the environment agency was um, actually uh, counting cows. That was one of their master data items as living organisms. Um, and then I, we worked with one a retail company or it was a, um, and, and they actually sold uh, adult cow suits. And the master data was, you know, cow suit, adult, size, large, you know, but is large L or is it the word large? You know, so we, we had a good laugh over that of, um, anyway, that, that was one of their master data items. Or, you know, when you look across a trademarks of the upper right, that was a master data for one of the um, government org organizations we worked with. Uh, in the lower middle, you know, wells or drilling, if you work with oil and gas. I mean that again. A lot, a lot of the master data when you drill, oh, no, no pun intended there. When you drill into it, um, seems so obvious until you know when it is the core of your company. You, you're trying to tell me that a um, an oil and gas company doesn't know what a well is, but it took years for it to have industry standards. They actually have some master data industry standards across multiple companies now. Um, PPDM is a, a data modeling effort, um, and that took years to really decide what what do you mean by a well because because it's so common. A lot of people have a different um, you know, view on that. Um, that's right next to the broccoli, because of course, right? So broccoli, if you're a restaurant, could be a, um, a one of your core, you know, material master. Um, um, to the left of the well is, is a, um, a school. So what is a classroom? Um, super relevant even to what data diversity does. Is a classroom a class where people sit in it? Could it be a virtual classroom with people sitting in it? For them, it was just the concept of a class that had a curriculum. Um, you know, a lot of types of things like that. Uh, what's a hospital? What's a location? What's a, a part? And you can kind of see all of these and kind of understand that, you know, we we had, we work with a, a truck company, you know, or automotive companies, not only the automotive, but what kind of parts go into that auto and how do we track all of that? So again, I won't, I won't kill this one to death. Did you kill something to death? Sorry, I'm in a mood today. Um, but, but hopefully that gives you some examples of the breadth of master data. And if it's new to you, what kind of might be some of your master data items. So the classic ones, I hopefully gave some interesting examples, um, but customer still does you know, it really is one of the more popular ones that people need to understand. Do we know our customer? And that could be citizens or student or patient, you know, it's not too much of a stretch. But here's a fictitious company, um, it's a sporting goods company, and these folks want to understand their customer. And I, I will talk more about this, but they want to get that ubiquitous classic need for, I want a 360 view of my customer. Why? Why is this even important, you might ask? But those are fun stories, Donna, but why do I care, right? So th this is a sporting goods company. Um, this is Stefan Kraus. Um, I'm also a skier, so this will come out. I'm big. <laughs> this is the story I use, right? He, he's a he's a ski instructor. I'm a, I, I'm a sporting goods company. I sell ski boots. This should be our classic company, right? He's 31. He's fit. He's a ski instructor in St. Moritz. He lives right there in the St. Moritz Valley. He, he's, he's actually a Nordic skier, too. He won the Engadine Ski Marathon. He's been in our loyalty program. We know how he likes to consume. He likes text messages, and we send him ads, and he buys everything online. But when you look at how much he actually spent, he only spent about 500 euro um, for that particular year, which isn't a lot, right? Because he gets all his gear free. He's good looking. He's fit. He's a ski instructor. He gets, you know, people want him to be a spokesperson. And, you know, he's actually, you'd think he's our best customer, but he's not. Because when you look at the data um, and really understand everything about him, maybe we need to either market him differently or maybe we don't market to him. He's not, he could be a spokesperson, but he's not going to actually be our top seller. Um, 
so um, when you look at you know the data again, there's another Stefan Krauss, and he's 62, and he's a banker in Zurich, and you wouldn't think he's going to be our classic outdoor sporting goods customer. In fact, he likes sports, but it's football, and he wants to go see his soccer team or his football team. He doesn't actually do the sports so much, except for when he does go on vacation once a year. And when he does, he wants the best equipment he can possibly afford because he works really hard and he makes a lot of money. And I have friends like this. They're like, I only do it once a year, but I'm going to have the best equipment out there. Right. And he spends it all to go on holiday and he likes to go in the store and he wants physical mail. He's kind of more old school. Right. And he's actually your best customer. I will clarify that all of that and analytics we just did around Stefan Krauss is not master data. It's the opportunity you can get from having good master data. Right. The master data is who's Stefan Krauss? Is it the banker um, who lives in Zurich and spends a lot of money with us? Or is it the ski instructor who lives near St. Moritz who is not our best customer um, and different age? And how do you identify who is Stefan Kraus? Might also be interested as one father and one son. And maybe the father's buying all the stuff for the son, right? That, that's all the stuff you can do with analytics. But master data, and I always joke, this is the story of my life. I've never been the sexy you know, front end. We're always on the back end getting the stuff done is the master data that enables all of this cool analytics. How do we know which Stefan Kraus is it? Do we go by his name, his age, his address, all of that? So that gets into kind of, I just want to kind of specify that this, a, a graphic like this really helped me earlier in my career understand master data, reference data, transactional data, and how that fits with warehousing and data management. And maybe you won't have the big light bulb I did by this one slide, but help me. Hopefully it'll help you. So again, this is sample transactional data. Again, maybe this is the, the sales system where we track everything. So Stefan Kraus, I don't know which one, um, but uh, on a certain date that he, I assume, purchased a product, which is a Telemark ski boot with a certain code, 250 euro. And the location was St. Moritz, I assume. That's the store. Again, I have to get mat metadata in there, right? Is that the store he bought it? Is that where he lives? I'm not sure. But right. The, and then Donna Burbank also bought the same ski boot in Boulder, Colorado. Again, is that where she lives? Is that where she bought it? But but whatever. Um, and, and then, you know, Stefan bought, I assume it's the son here, or maybe it's the father, bought, uh, he's probably the dad because it's in Zurich, right? He bought a North Face down jacket. This month he bought, you know, Wendy Hugh bought some yoga pants at the same store in New York, et cetera. That's your transactions, right? The fact that Stefan bought all of this stuff, that's probably what you start summarizing in a data warehouse. Um, the master data is who is the customer? Is Stefan Kraus was the first one, the son who bought his boots in St. Moritz and the second one, the father who bought his down jacket in Zurich? Perhaps, right? That's what you need to understand, which was Stefan Kraus. Also, your product is going to be your master data. Now, you'll see that that same Telemark ski boot is um, a different product code. Is that, a, is that a typo? Is that wrong? Is it because we have different product codes in the US and Europe and they should be different, right? That What is our core list of products that we sell? And is there a difference in Europe and the US? Is the same boot packaged differently? Are there different components? Is the plastic different based on the region? All of that is your product master data and all the components that go into that, your price, all of that. Location um, could either be your master data. Um, you know, that could be, these are our store locations, right? And we know that there's a Zurich, uh, Switzerland for our store, and there's a Boulder store. We know that. Uh, reference, or that could be reference data. It depends how we, we model it out. Clearly, I would say some of your reference data is maybe the codes, right? And right there, I can say Boulder, Colorado, that's a, a state code, CO, but CH is the country code for Switzerland. So gosh, we, we need to even manage our reference data better because those are not apples and apples, they're apples and oranges, right? So anyway, a lot of examples from one example, but again, your transactions are the fact, all the stuff Stefan bought or Donna bought. Um, the master data is who's Stefan and who's Donna and who's Wendy and who's Joe, right? Or, or what a location, what do they mean, right? So that's kind of shows you how all these things hopefully fit together. Um, kind of talked about this before, but again, one person's master data is another person's reference data. You know, it, it, it could be that, you know, regions or markets or locations are second, you know, I want to say secondary, they're just lists, or it could be, again, I'm, I'm a map company or I'm a, in the environment agency and I track locations for a living, right? Or it could be the location of my store, which is a first order thing. I don't want to get too techie or nerdy about that. Um, Right. But, 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 you know, the, I, I, I almost think of reference data as the little cousin of master data, right? They're, they're often your code lists, things that, you know, your country codes, your um, state codes, things like that, that might uh, kind of be managed more statically. Um, anyway, uh, worth talking through. People get themselves in a knot about that a lot. I almost, man you know, say I, don't, I, I do care, but do we care what we call it? How do you manage it? Right. Um, so how do you, how do you understand all that? 
process to understand how do I get a single view of who Stefan Kraus is. And it, it takes a lot. One, one is the architecture. How do we model out? How do we know what the unique identifier is? Is it for just first name, last name, first name, last name, date of birth, social insurance number, whatever, right? So how do you get, how do we match merge and understand that? But also the, the governance, who's accountable across these different um, systems, right? Of, of, you know, point of sale and who who enters the data and who, if the, if we see that there's more than one Stefan Cross, who knows? How, how do we, who, who decides that? Is it the system? Can we automate that sometimes? Sometimes you, you never want to. We work with some medical companies and, and the risk of even if there's a 99.9% .9 match, that, that I know that this Stefan Krauss is the dad and the other one is the son, I'm going to amputate his leg. I, I want to or do heart surgery. I want to be absolutely sure I have the right patient here. Um, so often there's a kind of a human in the loop where somebody has to validate that before a match is approved, right? Not always that extreme is something like medical, but you know, often the data is important. Or you might do that as you're training the model and then maybe you trust the model more and more for the match rules. But data governance and stewardship and who quote owns your master data can get really tricky. And we'll talk a lot more about that. Often how you understand who quote owns or updates the data is through business process, right? How is the data updated across the journey of, you know, may, maybe, you know, someone signed up and they're in the loyalty program and that's where we get their address. But then when they buy the product, they change their address. Um, they told the salesperson, but does that get sent back in, right? There's a lot of different touch points to that data. And that's why it's master data, right? That's why you do need to understand both the business process or the customer journey. And I think often that's forgotten. We think of it from our system perspective. Okay, person was, um, you know, it came in the store, then it goes into the sales system, and then we invoice, and that comes out of the finance system. But what was the customer journey? I, I, I often give a good example uh, for master data. When, when master data works well, that's a really good customer experience. And, and the only place in the world I have any... I don't know, uh, leverage or uh, I feel important is with airlines because I'm a consultant and fly around a lot, right? So, but I had an example, um, the airline I was with, I was trying to book a flight online from Denver to London. There was a client I was going to a lot um, and I couldn't book it online for some reason. And they said, could you call? So I call um, and, and they recognize my number clearly. And they say, Ms. Burbank, is, are you calling about the flight you're trying to book from Denver to London, um, would you like to take the same flight you took last month and could we book that for you? Could be creepy, but it wasn't creepy to me because I'm a data person. I knew they should know all that data. They should know my phone number. I gave it to them. They should know that I'm booking online. They should know because I logged in with my user ID and they should know all of these different things because they've seen all my previous transactions. So because they were had good master data, they knew how to identify who Donna Burbank is. They had a really good customer experience, right? Compare that to something like my insurance company where I've been trying to update my address with them online for about three years now and they still send it to the wrong place and I call and they update one place and it doesn't, you know, almost every negative customer, I, I've ruined this for all my friends and family. They say, you know, I had a problem with the bank and I updated my whatever and they didn't. And I told them they had a master data problem. <laughs> I actually have a friend that does it all the time because once you now see that, you almost can't see any customer interaction that's, you know, bad with your data or they... I don't know, I checked into a hotel and I didn't have my number and, and they so they didn't know my the room preference I had, right? That's a master data problem. Or I have my bank sends me both a credit card statement and my checking account statement and my savings account statement as separate letters. They still send me letters, even though I've asked, please, I want it all online, right? That's how do they not know that Donna Burbank, one person is Donna Burbank has three different accounts and still one Donna Burbank, right? That's master data, right? So think in your own life, how many, you know, either positive, which is when master data works well, or negative when you don't have good master data, um, the, you just think in your own life and, you know, or, or in your own company, right? You probably have a whole lot more in your own company, but sometimes it's fun to just, you know, any experience you have, how, how could master data have helped with that, right? So there's different ways to implement uh, master data, um, and sometimes it's an evolution, um, and, and then there's different modes of master data. So the example, um, you know, for, for reporting, trying to get that 360 view of customer, that, that's either an analytics or basic reporting. We call that almost an analytic um, master data where I'm, I'm getting that single view of customer. And why? Because I want to report on that. I want a data warehouse that shows total customer spend by product. I need to have good product master data and I need to good, have good um, customer master data. So often in 
you know, if you've ever done a bust matrix for your your, your data warehouse, you know, kind of you know, the you know, your conform dimensions basically in your warehouse are going to be your master data, right? Um, so that's often why people do master data. It's often a first step, right? Because I think the ultimate it's going to help with your customer experience is operational master data where you actually sync the data across systems right that donna burbank has updated her address in one system that cascades to all the other systems so we know we have the single clean record which is why master data and data quality go hand in hand right i, I am passionate that you always want a clean data quality at its source not in the re, not in the warehouse not in your data you know reporting system because you're just cleaning it up over and over and over. And so master data can help enable that. Let's have a common set of rules and push back to the systems, right? Sometimes you have it all in one system. Sometimes on the left, you might just sort of register it and it still lives in the system. Um, I, I said, I'll, I won't read through all of these rights, but you, you, you know, the registry is basically just, you have the IDs and you're providing a cross-reference, right? Coexistence is where you, you have it in the different source systems um, and you kind of harmonize back across centralized, which which often um, people sort of have, a, if, if there's a bad rap about master data, it's sort of what people think it is. That means I have to force everyone to, to enter the data into M, the MDM system. And I, I would say you very rarely want to do that, maybe for reference data, right? Um, but you want to make it as minimally as improve, uh, <laughs> intrusive as possible. Um, before I get there, you know, consolidation would be it's all in one place, but it's coming kind of sourced from the source systems. And there's different flavors of it isn't always a, even an all or one. What, what I find interesting about master data, you can have an academic view of it, but really you just need to look holistically at the real world because some systems you can't push back to, right? It's ideally, I think, and I'll, I'll show my bias. You let people enter the data in the source system. That's what they're doing as part of their day job. I enter it into the CRM. I enter it into the finance system. And you do have some sort of central hub that does, I almost call that like your liver, <laughs> the liver of the system. It cleans it, it validates, it creates a golden record, and then it does in a perfect world cascade back to the CRM and back into this, you know, the finance system and the marketing system and all these other things, because it should be when it's done well just fit into people's day job. And when they look for a drop down list of the customers, it's the clean visit the customers or, or the different locations, it's just there. So I think in a perfect world, um, you do have people enter into the systems in their day job. It then cascades into the MDM that does the proper, you know, govern uh, match and merge and then pushes back and that can go into your sales system. In the real world, it's, it's just more complicated than that. And it might be done in a phased approach. Often it's the source systems aren't very friendly, right? It could just be, Again, theoretically, that'll be great. And it's all API enabled or, you know, uh, event driven. When the event happens, it, it cascades to everything. But you're working with a mainframe system, right? That can only accept certain, you know, files that can be uploaded once a night, right? So that's not ideal, but that just is the reality of the system I have, right? And, and when I get frustrated, I love to hate the vendors, but, you know, you'll, you'll try to do a master data system and they'll say, but I'm the system of record. No, I'm the system of record. I'm the golden child. Yeah, I am the golden record. Even something like the, one of the biggest misconceptions, I think, is CRM, right? Your customer, we have a CRM. That means we have master data. Mm, no, you, you might enter your, your, your leads into the CRM. And maybe that really is the only place where things are, are entered, but is, is that then cleansed? And is it cascaded across the other systems? And is it, you know, you really need to look holistically. And, and very rarely, if ever, is your system of record the master data only source that just sits by itself in a vacuum, right? Um, and mo moving ahead, um, one way to think of it, and this, this is sort of a amalgamation of those different styles. I, I feel that previous slide is a bit academic. It is very also common. Um, I like to look at it. I always draw one of these pictures in the real world. Like, what systems do we have? How do we want to manage it and, and what's the purpose, right? So this could be a standard. And this does kind of show that more centralized approach. I, I will show my bias. You, you kind of have to have something that's that liver and, and being too passive and just doing a kind of a linking everything together generally is, is not enough to really get the oomph that you need from MDM. Um, so, but again, you might, you might have a CRM system, your in-store sales, your finance, marketing, online, supply chain, all of these different systems that either, you know, can be kind of mastered into this, kind of showing it like a database, and it generally is, right? That's going to do your data quality, your match merge. If you have to have a data steward, look at it. Um, and they can kind of create these golden records. I kind of have your reference data sets as the 
cousin <laughs> that kind of lives there that they are related and then you can hopefully publish back to those systems um, the end user applications can kind of do a lookup so they only have the right source and that often can feed your data warehouse for reporting right what what makes that kind of complicated but also super valuable that each of these systems that often they all think they i'm the golden record right? <laughs> and, and the people managing them think they own the system often right that's that's what makes MDM hard. You have to get a lot of people and a lot of systems talking together and people are complicated and tech is complicated. And at its core, MDM is completely simple. I just want to get the same first name and last name for my customer. How hard is that? Ha ha ha. Right. But, but it really at its core should not. None of this is brain surgery. It's just getting a lot of pieces working together. And that, that's why you have to have a these approaches I'll kind of show you through modeling it and, and mapping it out. Pictures worth a thousand words. Just you know, often just laying this out can can solve a lot of problems. Um, but the CRM system might track first name, last name, address, you know, email, a spouse of that person, so you can send them a birthday card. You know, that that has a certain system uh, purposes. Maybe when you go to the store, and, you know, and you buy something, this drives me crazy, and I always say no. You know, what's your postal code, or what's your name, or what's your phone number? I have actually refused. I won't go through all my rants, but I've actually refused to buy something in a store. You do not need my email address. I'm just trying to buy something. And when I walked out, they were shocked. I'm like, no, you don't need my email. I'm trying to buy a thing from you. Here's my money. Um, but anyway, they might get your first name and the postal code of where you live. Um, finance has their after. I won't read through each one, right? But, but there's some that's an overlap. Um, and that some are new. Maybe, maybe only marketing has the Twitter ID of the person because who else cares, right? But maybe they do. So what well, MDM, and, and there's an art and a science to this of what is, I put kind of super slash subset. It's a superset in the sense that it is the best set of records from all of the different systems, but as a subset in that it isn't every attribute known to humanity. That might be in your analytics. So working with a customer in London right now, um, and that's their biggest challenge is, you know, in the analytics system they have, there may be a thousand attributes about that customer they want to manage, but there's a misconception that that's your master data. Your master data might be 10 or 20. How do I uniquely identify that customer? And what are those core? And again, this some methodologies to define. I often love to go back to common sense, right? What are those core things to identify and manage that customer that is Donna Burbank, right? My name, my family name, my address, state email that that kind of stuff right and then maybe the reference data is the country codes and state codes sort of around that so what what these tools or what you write yourself the master data ecosystem can help with um is creating that what we call the golden record right so the, what's in gray and top are all those systems that do have master data what, what's in bold in the gray would be those are the good golden records, right? So I have John Smith, I have Jack Smith, I have Jay Smith, I have John spelled wrong Smith. How, how do I know, you know, that could be Stefan or Stefan with two N's, right? How do I know, is that really the same person? Is it John Smith that has the father and a son or uh, it's just a very common name? And once I do know that it's John Smith, do I have all the best records? Even things like, do I spell out the word street or do I abbreviate street? And I know that's where we data folks seem really nerdy and, and weird, you know, because we get obsessed about that stuff, but it does matter because you can't match the word street with the word, you know, the abbreviation ST. Well, you can, that's what a lot of these, you know, um, data quality tools that are embedded in MDM tool, master data management tools can, can help with, right? But the more you can standardize, I know that this is one, one main street, or maybe one system has the main street, but not all of them have the apartment, right? I mean, I won't talk forever about this, but that, that is kind of the, the magic that, that's simple at its core, but can be very complex to implement, is how do I, A, define what those fields are? Do we all agree? Um, what does what good look like? How do I identify what's good? Are there standards that we need to apply to this data? And then once you have that, then you can publish so the, the John that is spelled wrong can be updated correctly, right? The people that don't have the email can be up, you know updated of the email. So that, that's the beauty of it. I, I, John changed his address online, everybody now knows about it immediately, it would be the perfect world, right? Sometimes, um, and, and a lot of these tools, and this is where, you know, I, I get nervous using the word AI and machine learning because it's overused, but there is a lot of automation that you can do with this now that humans don't have to manually go through this, right? That, you know, th there's, there's algorithms you can use to say, hey, this looks like a social security number or, you know, and some of it's, you know, human enabled. Can I, can I kind of make a list that John could also be Jack or, or these are common 
nicknames for the same name. Maybe we can, you know, help automate some of that, right? There's a lot of tools. That's why these tools um, can be helpful. You also, as I mentioned before, maybe want a human in the loop to say, hey, we think this is the same John Smith. Is this right? Um, and because it got the more, you know, we were just talking, I was talking with my team this morning, all the funny or strange stories. We had, you know, one company had 75 different versions of the word AT&T, right? And how, I mean, it's only, what, four <laughs> four characters, how can that be? But, you know, A-T in the word and is it spelled out American Telegraph, you know, all of that stuff um, can be complicated. And, and then just people are complicated. Names and family names are, are, are complicated. Uh, we have one school we work with, and I want to have the, the parents be, you know, have a data literacy course because the num there's a high number of twins for whatever reason and there's folks that have you know twin girls named Janie and Joni, and I, I you know apart from whether those are fine names or not I felt like you are creating a data quality nightmare for your children right how how would a system know that Janie and Joni same parent same birth date same gender same same address you really only know it from the teacher who looks at it and goes oh yeah Janie and Joni are in my class um, right some stuff you just can't automate. I want to teach parents not to do that or, or Elon Musk that has, you know, <laughs> you can, you have whatever opinion you have of him, but he has, you know, uh, non-standard characters in his children's names, right? So does a dat or do numbers exist in a, in a name, right? So he's probably messing up the algorithm himself. It's probably why he did it, right? Anyway, so names are historically complicated and family relationships and people have the same names within a family and all of that. You can automate a lot of that, but sometimes you do need a human, especially as I mentioned, if it's a medical thing or, a, you know, if you're just doing, I want to say just because I know marketing is important, but if it's just a marketing campaign and the worst thing that happens is someone gets two emails, not great, but it's not the same as someone doing surgery and the wrong person, right? So anyway, hopefully that helped. It helped me when I was first learning this stuff. A lot of complexity in this when you're actually doing it. But at its core, it's not that complicated. And the business value is amazing, right? That I know when I'm trying to sell to this person or market to this person or help this person or educate this person, I have the single view of this core master data. So uh, I've, I've kind of already talked through this, but what drives me crazy, and the vendors are just as bad at this as anyone else, is, you know, we're going to buy MDM because we're going to give you the 360 view of the customer. And then I do my Donna rant of that's not the 360 view of the customer. It's the single view of the customer. It's <laughs> you need to get the single view of the customer to enable analytics, right? So your MDM golden record might feed your data warehouse. Again, that's your conform dimension. I want to say customer by region, customer and region are both either master or reference data, right? Or maybe I want to do a cool graph database to understand all my social networks across, again, buying patterns of customers. But if you have duplicate customers, you can't really, your, your graph, you, know, you got to have good data to enable all your analytics, right? Um, or even across your data lake, your data lake isn't just garbage dumped there and magic comes out, right? Even, even, even data scientists who are maybe doing, you know, across broad swaths of data would really like to have that data be clean, right? So even if social media sentiment analysis, do I know that which Stefan Krauss tweeted something about my company? I'd like to know which one is it, right? So again, MDM enables reporting and analytics, but it is not reporting and analytics. And I've just, I, I want to stress that because more and more I've seen that, and it can be an initial first step, but I've got several customers now who've kind of done, it, it can work in many ways as a first step. We don't have clean master data, so we're going to do some graph type analytics and, and, and get these patterns across that we have 16 different customers and we think this is the best customer. But until you actually enable that as a golden record and push it back to the source systems, it really is just analytics. You, you have some ideas and you can manually, manually update, but it's, it's a first step. And a lot of the analytics type tools or the um, CDP platform, you know, customer um, data platforms and things sort of. I get a little nervous. They market themselves as being, quote, the golden record, but they, they don't go all the way there, right? They're doing it kind of through analytics. You can learn a lot from that. They can be embedded in MDM, but it is not MDM or Master Data Management. So oh, um, the other part of it, and that what I just talked about was a bit, I mean, not super techie, but a little bit more on the architecture implementation side. I like this quote from Gartner. So a few years old now, but it's it still holds true that master data management when done well is super critical and beneficial. They often fail like anything that's been around for a long time. It doesn't mean that MDM is impossible. It's just, you know, <laughs> a lot of folks don't finish a running race. It doesn't mean you stop doing running races, right? But 
But what makes things fail is often that alignment with business process or not having the governance. And I would 120% agree with that. Um, that that's what makes it valuable and also makes it complicated, right? You can't just buy a tool and slap the tool on or do some even fuzzy matching across the stuff and expect magic to happen, right? Because why, or even buy a tool that says, we already have customer master, just buy our thing. What makes your company unique is your master data and you run your company in a unique way and there will be exceptions. If, if it were that easy that every restaurant or retail company or hospital or school ran the same way, then you know, that wouldn't be your differentiator. That's just not, that's not, you know, that's not how the world works. And, and, and you need to think through these things. And folks will often say, well, do we have to do the data model? Do we have to do the business rules? I'm like, well, if you want it to work, right? Because that's going to actually find the issue. Yes, this, you're not the first person to have ever modeled an address, right? <laughs> so yeah, you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, but often, you know, is that the mailing address? Is that the build to address? Is that ship to address? Who updates the address, right? That all that can get very, very complicated. Can you have a PO box and an address? Yes, if it's the build to, but not if it's the ship to, right? All of that nerdy, boring, complicated stuff kind of has to be thought through. You can't automate everything. So um, thinking of data governance and stewardship, uh, I'll not go too much in, into this, but there's different ways to think of it. Could, do we, how do we create that owner of the data, so I have patient data or I have product data, right? Would I have a, the owner of the manufacturing process owns that product data, right? Or, or I, I, I pay, uh, customer data is the owner of the CRM system, the owner of my customer data. That should make you nervous, right? I don't think so. They might own that CRM and know how to manage the CRM. Or this one is a whole Donna Rant webinar, and I, I'll hold back. But it's more and more common to say I've seen. We'll just have a single owner for product or, or customer. And, and that seems really clean. You, I would think maybe a single data architect for product or customer, but be, who owns a who owns a patient, right? I, I go into the hospital and I, I, I go and I see the, the receptionist and they take my billing information and my insurance information. And then I go to the doctor and they give me a diagnosis. Who owns my patient information? Well, the person who gave, took my insurance to understand that, I hope for that person doesn't own my diagnosis. You know, I hope the doctor doesn't own my, my billing information. They would they wouldn't want to do that either, right? So there's all because your master data is touched by many, many processes, you really need to look at it holistically. It's too simplistic. And I will die on my hill on that one. It's too complex simplistic to just have a single owner. It would be nice. You might have a single person kind of coordinating teams of people who need to collectively have input. Um and there might be an exception with reference data, right? I, I do own the I don't know, a list of these codes or I own the locations or something, um, but they, not so much with master data because the point of it is that it's cross-functional. Um, you might have your 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 governance by org. You know, I, I have sales, but I have North Mexico sales and North America sales and I have European sales and they all have a different viewpoint, right? Or I have a finance team, which is a little different from capability. And I I, I kind of prefer capability because org, org, orgs change, capabilities don't. I still have finance, I still have marketing, I still have supply chain whether marketing is now reporting up to sales or not, marketing still happens, right? The name of that department might change. But anyway, different ways to look at that. Why am I bringing that up in a master data conversation? We'll talk more about that. So there's also different roles, right? I have an owner that creates some of these rules. What are the fields around a customer and who manages customer? The steward might get into some of these data quality rules. And you might have a technical data steward who runs your CRM system and things, right? Um, you need to look across all of that. You also need to think of the data model. Um, you know, often when we come in and do a, a work with a company, we have a high level view of all their data and how it fits together. And we start to color code it, right? We have staff and customers and products. Um, that blue stuff is kind of your, your master data. The reference data might be their departments and the locations the department of staff works in. Um, and it really almost creates a roadmap and shows the interconnections um, across your master data. Find this super helpful and hard to not do that as we go through. Why I, I, I had the comment of you can't just have a single owner is really that this is why you need to link the governance and the process and the data together, right? So maybe our our master data is things like customer and vendor and material, but customer is used across, you know, order to, you know, all of these are used across your different business processes and there's different touch points and different stewards across each one of those. So your business processes are managing all of that data, right? So the same data flow can be, 
you know, the data is touched across the way. So really it's those touch points. So customer is going to be used in order to cash and source to pay and for, you know, or vendor is going to be in all where those dots are across, right? And each person is, is really looking at it in a different area. We had a success story. We often, when we do these, we do a workshop and we whiteboard it out and we, we draw out the business process. We work with a big um, aerospace company and they were having problems with their bi billing um, payment terms for their vendors. Uh, it was it always seemed to be wrong and they couldn't do financial forecasts. When we drew it out, actually say, say, say vendor right there has three dots. So someone had updated the payment terms then someone else along later in the process updated the payment terms and then a third person updated it. and they just didn't see it because they only saw that it was a very easy thing to then quote, do we have a single steward or is there an approval process when someone does want to change it? Wasn't that hard to figure out, but if we only had one owner for a vendor, we wouldn't have seen that, right? We had to actually look through the process and see who, who touches it and who owns it across the way, across that journey. And, and that's what makes it complicated. There's data management processes, which design those rules and implementation. There's governance of then who does own that or steward it. And, and generally it's a, a group of stewards. Maybe there's the different, ad, again, the patient, the, the front office owns my, my insurance information. The doctor owns the, the um, what's wrong with me, my diagnosis, right? Um, and then it should fit into your business process operational workflow. Back to what I was saying, the MDM, when it works well, should be minimally invasive. I, I put the right data for my job and it cascades across everybody else's and I have the right rules in place so that whatever I enter, but those rules, that's where you need those data owners and stewards. And we collectively build those rules as part of governance and then going day to day, it should be really easy, but you do need that little bit of that conflict to get people to agree on those rules and, and that's needed. One of the things I we like to do is a good old fashioned CRUD matrix, right? Where is customer data created, read, updated, and deleted? And often it's those multiple updates or multiple creates, or you know, we've gone into companies that I kid you not, three different master data management systems in the same company for customer. And, and who no one saw that, right? Because no one had the time or the effort of the governance or the architecture to step back and everyone was doing, no one was trying to do the wrong thing. They're all trying to do the right thing but they didn't do this holistically. And that's why master data right then right can be super easy and beneficial when you don't take a time to map out the architecture and the governance and the processes, that's where it gets complicated. Um, again, getting all of the, often there's a committee, right? Because who owns patient, customer, student? So it's, you know, a customer is involved in sales and marketing and product development and legal and, it, you know, so all of that. <laughs> so finance, custom, you know, all of you really need a cross-functional view to set up those rules so that you're not breaking something for somebody else. One quick um, success story. Um, this this brings the cheese incident back to full circle that I brought up in the beginning, uh, that it did work out in the end. And, and again, we came in as consultants. They didn't know necessarily what was wrong or why, um, or even the words master data management. But when we sold it up to the CEO, we basically told that story of you know when they created the product in, in the design kitchen, and then we went to supply chain and the marketing. Um, by the time you got to the point of sale system, there's certain data across the across all of your business processes, across several different owners slash stewards. Um, and we we mapped, we did all the things I just talked about. We did data models, we did process, we did crud matrices, we we designed data governance to be minimally intrusive. They already had a product launch. Um, uh, process and we added data to that conversation. Did we check the data before we launched this product and make sure data had a, a first order conversation? And do we have the right quote steward that are talking to each other across supply chain and marketing? And are we agreeing on the right price? Simple enough answer, but it took a bit. And you know, we and we sold master data management up to the CEO because she got that. She understood the risk and 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 the reward as part of that. So it can work. It does work. Um, it takes a little bit of cross-functional planning and design, but but none of this is rocket science. And a lot of it can be done in workshops and things like that. So um, MDM is more important and, than ever. It's more popular than ever because it's so valuable, but you really need to look cross-functionally across the org to do that. Um, again, I do want to open it up for, for questions, um, but actually next month, if you're able to join us, uh, data architecture and governance, or, or we'll go a little more detailed into that if, if governance and architecture are new to you, um, that will help with some of the MDM. We do this for a living. If you need help, there's my blatant plug. And with that, I will open it up uh, to questions with Shannon. So over to you. Thank you so much, as always. Appreciate another great presentation and been feeling the love from the community. So just uh, I'll reiterate, I always brag that we have the best community in the world. Uh, just love that y'all are so engaged, right? 
Um, so, and just diving in here to answer the most commonly asked questions, uh, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday to everybody with links to the slides and links to the recording. But diving in here, Donna, so is there an implementation style which is most popular or preferred? Uh, uh. Um, I, 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 I wouldn't say, I, I, I think the, the full, when you're pushing the, the ultimate is a centralized source where you're pushing back to the source system to be published and subscribe. Like that is actually what's making it usable. I think the most popular, unfortunately, and, it, and I don't think it's unfortunate because it's, as long as it's a phased approach, a lot of people start with the analytical um, method. And I would agree with that, right? So even if I know I want to do the full publish and subscribe back to source systems, do all of my common business rules, it's a bit of a safer bet to report on that first and make sure we're okay, we're reporting on it, we trust it, and then start pushing back to source systems. Because pushing back to source is where you get the most value but it's also the most risk. If this is the wrong Joe Smith and now I've cascaded it across the org, then that gives MDM a bad name. So I think, yeah, the full publish and subscribe, I do think is, is the best, is the most, I would quote, invasive, but the most valuable. But I think a step along the way is to do your analytical version first, get that trust, get people buy-in, and then, then start doing the pushback. Do you differentiate mastering data from master data management? Hmm, now there's a subtle question. Um, I think so. I'm not sure where you were headed with that, but I think mastering data would probably be that creating the golden record, right? There, there's the whole methodology of how you do that match merge. Master data management, I think, does bring in that more holistic view of what's the business process around that. How is this master data being cascaded across the different systems, the different, do we have to change the different business process for how that data is entered, who enters it, how we manage it? So I, I think that holistic view, including governance and process, is master data management. Mastering data is probably the, the, the technical aspect of how we arrange that gold direct. And they're related, but that, that's how I would answer that question. Okay, so it, it, Donna, is it essential to start MDM with taxonomy? I'm surprised to see too many MDM efforts skipping that and tend to mimic the source systems, which tend to fail. Um, I think it depends what it what it is. I think, for example, um, product is a classic one with kind of a taxonomy. I think the common aspect of taxonomy and just plain old master data or your hierarchies is, is your data model because that's going to help, you know, is there even a hierarchy embedded in this? And then how you manage a taxonomy is more the the values within it. Um, so I, I don't think you have to, I think you have to start MDM with the design and I think taxonomy depending on the on the domain um, is a super important effort as, as part of that because that's really you know, and then who 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 are the stewards that agree on that product taxonomy and, and that kind of thing is a big part of the, the governance and the process around that. So yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that taxonomies are important as well. Okay, well, we just have a few minutes left um, and there's a reference question, if you can go back to slide 21. Oh dear. Oh, just to pull that up. Um, oh, sorry, I'm trying. Uh, see if I can get up, we can get that. I can't because it doesn't seem to want to move my slides. Yes, I can. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to leave that up for the person to ask their question. But um, in the meantime, if you have a known data quality issue and are headed toward an MDM solution, when is the most optimal time to clean the data? Oh, great to... question. I'm excited to ask that one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I, I saw that one. I wouldn't have... Oh, yeah, I didn't let people hear it. When do you clean the data, like before or after the implement? I, I think it's a key part of it, right? But there, there's a bit of an art and a science to that, right? If there's known data quality issues and everyone's around that, and that's why people are asking for master data management, by all means, you want to get, that is the value of master data is part of that data quality. They're embedded. I see them both the same. You can't do master data without data quality. Jump right into that. And then you're going to be the hero because we solve the billing issues, right? Because we didn't have the right addresses. Not always are people on that right, understand that yet. So sometimes, and you have to do this carefully, so don't tell everyone that Donna Burbank said build dashboards with poor data quality, right? But you sometimes do that, right? Because often the business doesn't see it or doesn't get it, right? So sometimes, if everyone's aware, please clean it as soon as you're possible. That's what you'd like to do in a perfect world. But sometimes people have to see the bad in order to understand, right? And, the class, and I just had a customer this morning saying they've done that successfully, right? Of You could say, hey, we need to clean up address data. Okay, sure, I have stuff to do. They see the dashboard with all the different addresses. You know, we should clean up this address data. I'm like, well, thank you for bringing that to my attention. We will, right? So it's a bit of a, a push and pull there. You don't want to do risky things by, you know, doing things with known 
data quality issues, but sometimes it is a bit of the Jedi mind trick of if people have to see it in order they, to understand it in order to clean it, right? So there's a bit of a push and pull, which is why that analytical first step is often a really good one so people can see it. Okay, Sorry. and I'm just wondering if you have a 30 second version of the difference between data domain centric and capability centric on this slide. 30 seconds is data would be the data itself, customer product, right? The data, those are the data, almost the things in your data model. Capability is like a capability diagram of the, or like finance is a capability of the organization. Customer isn't a capability, it's a thing. So one's a thing, one's a noun and one's a verb, right? In a way, customer are your things, capabilities are the things you do to manage the things like marketing and finance and supply chain and sales and things like that. That might've been 20 seconds. <laughs> it's perfect timing. All right. <laughs> well, 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 that, well, that's Donna. Is it 10 seconds. People often get that wrong. Like, what? These are all words that mean things in the organization, but is it a noun? Is it a verb? What, like, what is it you're describing? I think people need to think through because I see that not being sloppy a lot. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <Senate>. <laughs> no, that's good. Thank you so much for another great presentation. Like I said, and thanks to all of our attendees again, uh, just for being so engaged in everything we do. Just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Oh.